All right, we'll get started in just a few minutes here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, John. Good morning, Alex. Give everybody a couple seconds to get logged in and get set up. Excited for today's Q&A. We have a good number of people in, so we'll get uh, started with introductions. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alex Tuccio. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur here in the Boston area. Um, I'm also leading the uh, Boston Globe's uh, Small Business Initiative. Um, here this morning with John. John, feel free to introduce yourself to the group. Hi, everyone. Uh, John Chesto. I cover business for the Boston Globe. I've been with the paper since 2014. I've uh, been covering business and politics in Boston since 2000. Uh, it's safe to say I've seen a lot in that time, but never quite uh, seen something like this. Uh, you know, we got through 9/11, we got through the Great Recession, but this is a whole, this is this this pandemic could be a, a game changer for a lot of industries. Definitely. Yeah, we've been running the uh, Small Business Initiative for about two weeks, and we have about 400 companies that are part of it, and it's unbelievable to see. You know, regardless of industry. You know, some of the stories that we see, you know, from the entrepreneurs themselves, the business owners, you know, the uh, decisions that they have to make, you know, they're tough, but also some of them are very inspirational. You know, people are scrapping together any idea possible to keep the business alive. So I uh, really appreciate you, you know, making the time to come on this morning and answer some questions. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I have to say I've been inspired too, uh, inspired by the, uh, I think everywhere you turn, uh, any business that can is also contributing uh, to, you know, is, is either donating their time or their money or their expertise. Uh, but I'm also inspired by every day I hear about from small business owners that are um, uh, struggling just to keep the business afloat. And I've, it's been, uh, you know, to imagine like what they go through, every story is different. And uh, I've learned a lot from the choices they've had to make. Definitely, totally agree. Um, so to get started, I just have a couple uh, disclaimers and instructions to read. So, uh, John, as you mentioned, you're a reporter. You're not a financial advisor. Um, none of your comments should be taken as direct financial advice or professional uh, financial advice. Um, you'll be using some of this conversation to fuel um, your future reporting. Um, and if you want more detail, you'll be reaching out to people uh, individually. Um, in terms of Zoom logistics, um, all attendees are muted uh, and no video will show. Um, this virtual event will be recorded and we will be distributing it after the event. Um, and then in terms of the Q&A portion, so John and I have uh, a couple of questions that were submitted before um, we started here um, that we'll be kicking it off, but we will have a live Q&A portion towards the end. Um, in order to submit your questions, use the Q&A feature, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, after you submit your question, click the raise hand icon, which is also at the bottom of the screen. Um, a blue raised hand icon will appear next to your screen name. Uh, this will help me find you in the queue. Um, I'll call out your name, which will allow you to uh, get ready to ask your question, and then your microphone will be unmuted um, if you'd like to ask the question live. And then once you're unmuted, you'll be able to ask the question um, or add a comment uh, as a follow-up to the question. And then when you're finished speaking, uh, we ask you that you mute yourself in order to uh, minimize uh, the background noise. Um, and so with that, we do have a couple questions uh, that we picked out ahead of time. Um, and we'll get started with those and then we'll get into the live uh, portion of the program. Um, so John, first question, uh, what does opening up the economy look like for Boston, uh, for businesses in general, but specifically retail? Uh, what changes are you seeing in the business community to prepare uh, for the new reality if business, for businesses uh, after restrictions are eased uh, in some time? Well, that's a great question. I just want to start uh, by saying I, I appreciate everyone submitting questions in advance. I got a look at them this morning and there's a lot of great questions. I think we're going to be able to get to even a small portion of them today. So I may be following up with stories about those questions. You can always reach out to me individually if you have a question and I can try to find the answer. Um, it, this question is, is something that comes up every day. What, what will the Boston look like when we're finally able to come back? Uh, it, it, you know, I think we're going to be 
able to come back uh, within the next couple of months, but I think it's going to look very different. Uh, what exactly, no one's quite sure yet, but I can tell you that the discussions that I'm hearing have to do with, uh, you know, keeping the social distancing, you know, are people going to be able to have to sit six feet away from each other, minimal? I mean, you, you're seeing some of the changes already at the, the retail stores that are open, the drug stores and the supermarkets, you know, they have you know, one way lines uh, in terms of the aisles, they have protection for the clerks. I think you're going to see a lot more of that in retail. Uh, I think, you know, you'll see more of it. I, I bet you you'll see more curbside pickup. Uh, I, I know that that's, uh, that's something that the retailers are trying to make happen. And most, most of the, uh, you know, at least among the not quote, non-essential businesses, uh, I know a, a number of retailers would like to at least have that option. So uh, I, the, the, the bigger question is what happens with, um, you know, gatherings, uh, events, uh, sporting events. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how you do, um, you know, go to a Red Sox game or uh, go to a concert at the TD Garden right now. And those, or a conference at the BCEC. And the, of course the BCEC right now is a hospital. Uh, the, the, those, the, 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 those things drive the economy in a lot of ways um, and do filter down to the small businesses. And that's, that's a harder thing to picture. But I do think you're going to see changes in the way uh, people get in and out and uh, interact in, in small businesses. Definitely. And I think for the Boston economy, another big part of it, and we got another question about tourism. Um, do you think there's any chance that the state funds any more programs for tourism? And then how should businesses be prepared to kind of deal with the fact that, you know, for months to come for the rest of the year, there might not be that, you know, normal level of influx of tourists in the Boston area? Well, I, I, I think that what's happening is the tourism uh, councils uh, across the state are pooling their resources they get from the state for a major tourism push that focuses on Massachusetts in general. I think they realize that maybe that that's the best way of spending their money rather than, you know, they sort of all operate as independent fiefdoms and uh, they don't have a lot of money. The state doesn't give them a lot of money, even though the state brings in hundreds of millions of dollars in hotel taxes every year very little of it goes back to tourism promotion. And so they're pulling their resources. I, I, I think, I don't think they're, I think they, they're very realistic about the problems with the state budget. So I don't think they are asking for more state funds. Uh, they would love to have it and they certainly need it. Uh, what they do want is state approval to, ta to have the right to impose hotel taxes locally to, to market their own regions. And uh, it'll be, I, I, I think this gives them an extra incentive to get, they've had that bill pending before this pandemic, but I think this could give them an extra incentive at the legislature to pass it. So you might see that. Uh, I think it's, I think everyone should be braced for a much lower uh, influx of travel and, and plan their staffing accordingly when, when we do get back in terms of, uh, and business travel into the city and into uh, the rest of Massachusetts. The one um, potential bright spot is, uh, you know, we, Boston benefits a lot from uh, air, air traffic because Logan is a very busy airport, uh, but uh, there are parts of the state, you know, the Berkshires, the Cape, uh, uh, you know, other parts of the state that benefit m mainly from driver driving tourists, and those could benefit because I think air travel is going to be one of the last things to come back. So I, I, I think that you know, so a place like Cape Cod, it's kind of uncertain right now, but it is, it's possible that they could still have a pretty good year in the end. Definitely. You mentioned some of the, uh, the programs the state's working on. Obviously, there's some, the federal program with the CARES Act. We got a bunch of questions about that. Um, one person uh, put into uh, the question submission before this, um, within the last week, there have been a slew of small business loan grant programs from local initiatives. Uh, the Federal Reserve Main Street Loan Program uh, the AG Small Business Relief Partnership. Is uh, anyone a clearinghouse on all these options and how is a small business supposed to navigate these options? Also, does one pre preclude using another? It's a great Anything? question. Uh, what I would recommend is uh, work with your, uh, either your trade group or, or your local chamber of commerce. I can speak for uh, here in Boston, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries in Massachusetts. They have uh, extensive uh, resources on their websites, a uh, long list of 
uh, everything from you know, uh, places to get help to how to fill out the form for PPP. Uh, I'm assuming PPP will, will be back again very soon. Uh, you know, they, their Senate's gonna be discussing it today. And I think the game plan is another 310 billion on top of the 350 that has disappeared in the last couple of weeks. So, so uh, the chambers all, I, I, I've seen some of the smaller chambers do, have been doing a great job. I've really been impressed by how the business groups have, sort, have stepped up and become uh, news organizations in their own way. Uh, and so that, that's, I, I, I would recommend going there. And I'm, I'm sure almost every uh, chamber or, uh, you know, uh, your trade group or, you know, or Associated Industries of Massachusetts, I, they have uh, connections for people who are volunteering services to advise businesses. And uh, I've seen many of those groups pop up where, you know, law firms want to put some of their pro bono efforts. Uh, same thing with accounting firms. Uh, so there's, there's help out there to be found. Uh, I, I know most, I've talked to probably 20 or 30 of these business groups and they're all working day and night. Uh, I, I think this is the, this is the time where you really got to take advantage of that, of that networking that they're doing. Definitely. So we have a bunch of good questions coming in through the live Q and a. Um, so we'll get to a couple of those now. Um, Cal has a question um, on evictions for commercial tenants. Um, are you expecting a moratorium on evictions with respect to commercial tenants? We lease from 14 different landlords. Uh, some are working with him, some are not. What are kind of your thoughts uh, on evictions in terms of commercial? Well, obviously, we just saw a bill become law that, that sort of put, put residential evictions on hold in Massachusetts. Uh, there has been some talk about uh, relief on the commercial side, uh, both, you know, I know that the city has been working on this. Uh, I know that there's been some people at state government that have been talking about it. it uh, I've not seen much progress with a bill toward those ends yet uh there there may be it's a lot of it also is trying to pressure the banks to give some relief for landlords because, because a lot of these landlords are small businesses uh in terms of their mortgage payments and from what i heard that that is more of the, sort of the effort the direction that things are going in terms of commercial tenants but i could be wrong i mean there might be uh, a, an effort underway that has not become public because i know this subject is, comes off, comes up a lot. Um, it, it, it seems to me that a bill to, in that regard would, would go a long way to help a lot of small businesses. For sure. Um, Ed Gaskin has a question. Uh, you might have heard about uh, Shake Shack with their PPP. Um, they ended up getting uh, you know, the $10 million check, even though they have $100 million on hand. Um, he was wondering for kind of your opinion, how could the SBA program be structured so that more small businesses with five employees or less receive funding as they can't compete with the larger businesses like Shake Shack. Like I saw Ruth Chris was in a similar situation to Shake Shack. Um, any insight on, you know, the SBA and how that program's running and how it could maybe benefit kind of the actual smaller of the small businesses? Well, I think, I think that the program was deliberately uh, a bit open-ended in terms of having to prove your impact from COVID-19 because it, as soon as you, if you started to really require such proof, the things would slow down. I mean, it was already sort of too complicated and things got gummed up. So I don't, I, I, what I think you could do it, and I don't think Congress is going to do this, but if you could have a tranche of, you know, um, small business funds that are only available for businesses with 25 or fewer employees or 10 or fewer employees. And that would really protect, uh, you know, it, it would protect a, a, a lot more of these businesses. They, they, maybe they didn't have the resources or the legal or banking advice to take it to get in early on the line. Um, you know, I'm just looking at the average two hundred six thousand dollars through the PPP, and there were more than a million loans under one hundred fifty thousand. So there were a lot of small businesses that did get in. Uh, it uh, it, and I've heard from a bunch of them. But I think, to be honest, my, uh, my impression is that it, you had to be a, a bit more sophisticated and try everything you could. I mean, I, I know one CEO of a small business who tried like a dozen banks on the opening day of uh, PPP and uh, because he was concerned his bank wouldn't be able to get their act together. And I think he was able to work with his original bank, but uh, I know a number of other businesses succeeded 
when their original bank failed by finding a, a, another bank that was able to help them. And I think it, it, generally, if you have a, a if you're larger and you have more resources, you're able to do that sort of shopping around. Uh, and so maybe you know, Congress is going to set aside 60 billion for. Uh, I would say it, it, it looks like lower income minority communities because uh, they recognize that people are being shut out and maybe you could include a threshold for business size as one uh, sort of disadvantaged group in that in that uh, set aside. Definitely. So we have David who asked another uh, follow up question on PPP, um, specifically around restaurants. Um, if there's any way we can get David's microphone unmuted, maybe we can have him join and uh, ask his question. Hello. Hey, hey David. David. Go Good ahead. Morning. Good morning. John, my question is, uh, many of us in the restaurant world uh, chose to close down completely and not continue with takeout, partly because of the financial concern of doing that, and largely out of protection for our staff, concern for their safety. I know that was true of the, the three restaurants I'm involved in. Um, the question is, once, assuming that we are lucky enough to actually get funding through the PPP, um, we're, many of us are concerned about the requirements re regarding um, forgiveness of the loan, needing to bring back nearly 100% of our payroll uh, in, a, in the context of not knowing when we might be able to open and actually not being open at all at this point. It seems very counterintuitive and, and not very helpful to require us to go back to nearly 100% payroll if uh, we have no uh, visibility on you know, that timeline for reopening. So yeah, I'm just wondering if you've heard of anything, any discussion about you know, loosening those, those rules at all for forgiveness? That I don't know. I mean, I, I, this has come up repeatedly, particularly for restaurants and hotels who um, you know, will be among the last to open at full speed. Uh, obviously, you need to have, there's a June 30th deadline of PPP, and I think a lot of people don't think we'll be back to 100% normalcy by June 30th. I have not heard whether they're going to change that. I would be a little surprised just because it seems like the system's moving through quickly at Congress right now. But if they were, I think you'd have a lot of supporters. Uh, it can't hurt to mention this to your uh, congressional delegation, um, you know, or just get the word across to say, listen, if you're going to approve this, uh, you, you have to give us some flexibility so that we can uh, hire people at the pace that we can safely hire them. Uh, you know, especially you're, you're, I think you're well aware that restaurants will probably be at 50% capacity or some diminished uh, seating capacity when we do reopen. And that's going to really hurt revenue. And you're probably not going to scale up to full staffing at that point. So it makes it hard. Um, I, I, I know people are aware of this problem, but well, whether they're going to be as dramatic and change some of the rules of PPP to adjust it, uh, it I, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, the last, last one, I, I think there's, there's a recognition that they have to get the money out as quickly as possible. So they may be reluctant to make significant changes, but it, I, I would think this would be a sensible one. I mean, I guess just my my quick follow up point is that if there aren't any changes to that, uh, it would be a shame to have a program that's meant to help us that, you know, if we aren't given, um, you know, close to 100% forgiveness uh, because of that payroll issue, then you have a lot of small businesses that are saddled with, uh, um, you know, a pretty hefty uh, repayment situation. Granted, it's a low interest rate, but, you know, within a two year span, um, my fear is that there, there are a lot of small businesses that are going to be digging out of holes in any case. And to add that to, you know, to the, the debt burden is, is pretty scary. I, I agree with you. And I think I understand the logic behind the June 30th, uh, you know, the two, they want, they want to make sure you, you have people on for two months, but, uh, I think it's a flaw in the system, uh, for the reasons you cite. And I've heard this from a lot of people. So hopefully, uh, the powers that be in Washington, uh, you know, whether this will be dictated in Congress or maybe when Treasury gets it, they'll, uh, you know, when they get the money again, maybe they'll uh, update the rules to reflect this problem. I, I honestly don't know. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks. Um, so we have Joyce Singer, uh, who also asked a question. Um, if we could unmute her microphone. Um, she has a question from the uh, sole proprietor side around PPP. Joyce, are you with us? I am. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, as I wrote, I'm an acupuncturist in Cambridge. Um, I haven't worked since early March. I shut my office down and probably won't start seeing patients again until mid-May. And I wondered if there are any... Um, I did apply for a small business um, loan, but I haven't heard anything. And I don't know if I would have by now. I applied a few weeks ago. Someone told me about it. And then I applied... Through the SBA. Uh, pardon? Through the SBA. Yes. Yeah. There was a small one that, loan. that you didn't have to um, pay back, actually. Yep. yep. That includes a, a, a grant. Uh, unfortunately for you, it would only be... If you're the if you don't have any employees, it'd only be a thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollars per employee, so the grant's pretty small. Oh, well, it would be great. It'd be better yeah. than nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, um, I haven't heard from them. Do I didn't even get a confirmation that they received it. I do have a number confirmation number. Yeah, what I would do is what I found from talking to small business people who have run up against this is to just keep trying them. You know, sometimes they're along wait lines, uh, awaits on the on the phone, but when they do get, I, I when when people do get a live person on the other end, they, I, th I think they've been surprised by how helpful the SBA has been. So I, I would just keep trying them. I know that seems like a futile effort sometimes if you're on hold for two hours. I've also heard that the wait time uh, prognosis uh, is usually pretty accurate You know, when you call. And unfortunately, sometimes it can be two hours. But sometimes people have called through and got through right away. I think that be with the SBA disaster loan, that's the best way to find out where you stand because you had to apply directly to the SBA. I see, so what I did online, this would be in addition to that, to phone them. Yes, please do phone them, yeah. I don't have the number offhand, but I- No, I can get that, yeah. I can get that, thank you. And unemployment for self-employed people, it's not really that promising, but there was something that seemed- Yeah, I mean, well, it just came out for today in Massachusetts, which is earlier than we all thought it would. Uh, it, it, they released rules to file for unemployment. I haven't had a chance to look to see when that the, that they kick off, but they they have made it official as of today. So uh, may, maybe there's a delay in terms of when you can actually get the money. But th uh, this is uh, you know with the additional federal assistance for unemployment that they're able to do this. Great. Well, anything else? Or that's helpful. I'm going to try and call them this afternoon. Yeah, please, please do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. So we have another question here. Um, Brian was curious about the lack of uh, childcare and how schools are closed and what you think uh, the impact might be in terms of reopening the economy, if any, and then kind of from your experience, you know, over the years um, in the Boston, you know, ecosystem, in your opinion, are there any businesses or specific industries that need to be opened up first in order for the reopening to be successful from, I guess, an economic perspective? Well, certainly child care centers would be helpful. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily call schools a business, although in this case, private schools are being treated, you know, private schools are getting PPP money. So they are, the nonprofits uh, are considered businesses. Um, I think we're going to hear any day now about whether school will be done for the school year and that will make it obviously uh, more challenging for uh, assuming that they do close it to the end of the school year for, for people when it's time to get back. I think we're going to, you know, a lot of people have adjusted to working from home and I, I think we're going to have a lot of that until the schools get back to normal. So obviously daycare centers are, are going to be important. Um, you know, they're going to have to ramp the, uh, the T back up a bit. Right now, it's, a, it's sort of on a, you know, a, uh, I wouldn't say a schedule, skeletal schedule, but it's, a, it's not working on a rush hour schedule. Uh, so they're going to have to figure that out. Um, you know, most of the business that are, quote, essential are, are, are obviously still going through this time. So those would be the services that I think we need to have to for the economy to help the economy get moving again. Yeah, even though I wouldn't necessarily call them businesses, uh, you know, getting a more robust transit. And what I, another thing I don't know is how, how we deal with transit and with the pandemic. Um, you know, obviously people who are taking the T to work now uh, are uh, nervous uh, about what they might catch on that, uh, on just by riding the T. So I'm not quite sure how we adjust that. Uh, if more people are driving into work, 
that could cause problems in Boston. Definitely. Um, we, had, we had one question you kind of alluded to about nonprofits. Um, are you aware of anything that's being done um, to kind of support the nonprofits in the area? Any programs or any, you know, anything you've heard kind of, you know, around the city? Well, one thing I'd say is the PPP, I'll mention that again, is it, it, they opened that up for nonprofits. So when this money comes back, uh, you know, when we get this surge of, I don't know, 310 billion, if that's the number, uh, then nonprofits should be applying if they think that they can, if the terms work for them. Uh, I will mention that the Boston Foundation has uh, set up a, a fund to help nonprofits in the Boston area, uh, and they're worth checking out. Um, I think you'll also find a lot of, uh, you know, also in Boston, there's a resiliency fund uh, that's helping a lot of the, the charitable organizations. Most of them, I think, in the city of Boston know about it. Uh, you know, the, these are organizations that are providing direct services to needy people. Uh, there, are, there are funds, similar funds set up in Springfield and Worcester, and some of the smaller cities, uh, and there might be some support for nonprofits there. Um, you, you know, there's also a, a statewide association for nonprofits, and I think they could provide some help and guidance in terms of uh, at least where to find advice. Definitely. So we have about two minutes left. I wanted to give you kind of the floor if there's any, you know, closing thoughts that you might have, you know, anything that's top of mind for you that you could, you know, share with the group. Well, uh, I, I guess what I would say is, uh, this is, this is probably for a lot of people on this call, it's probably the, the toughest time that they've ever had to deal with in their, uh, you know, their careers. Uh, it, it, it pays to be creative and it pays to be resilient and not give up. Um, it, I, I'm sorry that I've not been able to get to even half the questions, but my email is jon.chesto at globe.com. Feel free to email me at any time, day or night. I might not be able to respond, but I'll try. I do read them all and I do try to find answers to the questions that people ask me. Um, so I guess I'd say uh, I wish everyone luck and I hope I can chat with you uh, electronically uh, over the course of this and see some of you in person back when things get to some kind of normalcy. Definitely. And I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention, if you're not part of um, the small business community um, that the Globe is running, um, I'm happy to reach out over email to anyone who is participating in this call uh, with more information. You know, we're sharing, you know, knowledge, resources every day. And so um, I'll be reaching out kind of with more information on that so that if you have more questions um, that we couldn't get to and you're just looking for kind of a community to be uh, a part of, then I'll be reaching out with that info. Um, we're getting requests for your email. If you could just repeat it one more time. <laughs> sure, it's J-O-N, that's John without an H, J-O-N dot C-H-E-S-T-O at globe.com. Awesome. Well, this was great. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it and found it helpful. Um, thank you so much for your willingness to come on this morning, John, and also be willing to talk with everybody more uh, when thank we wrap up. Hearing from everybody. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.